welcome to Artful Design TV, COVID-19 edition. We're online and in quarantine. I'm your host, Go Wong, and our co-producer is Kung Woo Kim. And as always, you can find us at artful.design slash TV. You can find a lot of content, including recordings of past episodes and related material. So uh, come and come back and visit us there. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Artful Design TV is a multi-format weekly series encompassing artful design, music, coding, critical making, with helpings of history and philosophy, and live check-ins. No experience needed. All are welcome. And like everything else we do, this is an experiment. And speaking of experiment, um, for those of you who have tuned in before, you might notice that we have, uh, have are trying a new setup here. You see like all this floating text over here? Well, we finally figured out a little bit about uh, how OBS, which is this open source, open broadcast software. And uh, it is really cool, but it also means that being a total noob of this, uh, this might be a total flaming disaster. So, but uh, it is an experiment and please bear with us. At some point, we might even just break down the design of uh, Artful Design TV itself at some point. And if things go wrong, that might just be an impromptu part of today's show. And our special guest today is Dan Truman, who is a professor of music at Princeton University. He's a composer, a fiddler, a wonderful human being. He's also one of the originators of the Laptop Orchestra. So we have much to check in with uh, from Dan, and we're gonna look back into the origin story and really the why of the Laptop Orchestra. In fact, um, Dan, uh, how are you doing? Doing great. It's good to be here. Thank you for asking me to come. Go. Thank you so much for being here. I love your shirt. It, it yes. Says, <laughs> it says Plork in great colors. <laughs> so, um, so today we're actually going to do something a little different. We're still going to do Numa Numa, uh, but we're going to do it a little longer, right? So we're going to start the piece. Uh, and you know, there's a drop. So move your body however is comfortable for you. And, uh, but then there's going to be a, you know, kind of more of a lower energy section, you can call it that. So feel free to kind of chill for a while, and then it's going to, intensity is going to pick back up. So we're going to do this for about 60 seconds, maybe a little more. Um, and uh, so here we go. that feels good. I feel like we're now into, I don't know, week 10, 11. I can't, I've lost count of, uh, of lockdown. So uh, I feel that we're all uh, could use a bit more movement in place. Um, so this brings us now to our main segment, which is thinking about stuff. And today we're going to think about the laptop orchestra and the critical question of the day is this, why a laptop orchestra? And in fact, going back to the very episode of Artful Design TV, we've been asking why, it's such a great and such a critical question for designing anything. Why did you design this thing? 
why did you make this thing? And why did you make this thing in the way that you did? And I think this set of questions is really, I think, at the heart of artful design. And I think for me, it's at the heart of any design. Um, and of course, we have not only Dan, but also Perry, uh, who's going to weigh in on this. Hopefully, Perry is, is on stream. Come if you can locate Perry and co-host him. Um, that'd be much appreciated. But before we uh, talk about why, uh, I do want to make sure to get everyone a sense of what a laptop orchestra is. Readers of uh, Artful Design might recall from chapter five that they're really the, the end of chapter five is all about the laptop orchestra as an ensemble of people, of laptops, of instruments created for this, for this medium and making music with these special speaker arrays. And so there's a whole philosophy behind why this laptop was designed this way. But what a laptop orchestra is, as you can see, is this ensemble. Here's the Princeton Laptop Orchestra, started in 2005 uh, by Dan Truman and Perry Cook. And, and this is kind of the, I guess you can call it the modern laptop orchestra as we know it, at, at least in this current form and scale. Um, a few years later, when I started on the faculty at Stanford, I, I started the Stanford Laptop Orchestra, and the Princeton one was Plork, and this is Slork. Uh, and the actual equipment that we use is, of course, a laptop. It sits on an audio interface that's multi-channel, uh, meaning we can actually have more than two channels of audio, and that becomes important when we talk about how the sound is made. But right now, the audio interface is sitting on a breakfast tray that's from Ikea, and uh, we sit on meditation mats and pillows, and sound comes out of a hemispherical speaker array for each station. Now, this is one station in the Stanford Laptop Orchestra, but it is modeled on the original Plork, the Princeton Laptop Orchestra model. And the multi-channel audio interface is able to independently address each of the six channels in, in, the, uh, in the speaker array. Um, and so if you look at this, you know, we can look at kind of what the laptop orchestra is typically between four people, that's a quartet perhaps, to a full, full ensemble of say 20, sometimes more. I believe Dan, you've made performances up to 40 people, maybe more than that even. Um, each human performer is paired with a meta instrument, uh, so-called because a laptop station uh, can be designed into different and more specific instruments. And each meta instrument is kind of what we saw, the laptop, the interface, and crucially, this multi-channel hemispherical speaker array. Um, there have been many versions of this. This is what we have in Slork, which has been fashioned out of IKEA salad bowls with holes drilled into them. Um, in this photo, we actually see one of the, the first generation hemispherical speaker arrays we use in Plork. And in fact, you see some of the, uh, the, the old school plorkers here, Alan, Rebecca, Matt, and there's me on the right looking, well, kind of like a serial killer there. Um, and now I believe Slork has a, uh, I mean, there have been new generations. I believe the, the latest generations have been called the DeLorean after the car in, in Back to the Future, because it really does look like a DeLorean. It, it's metallic, it's shiny, it looks like it's about to take off. Um, and we'll come back and talk about the speaker array in more detail, but to give you an idea of what things sound like. So this is a piece called Twilight from 2013. In this case, we're using a game track controller. And this game track controller is actually um, kind of our way of controlling the sound. First of all, we you know, sort of pull the sound physically out of the ground. And then we move our, our arms and our hands to change how that sound is actually made. Right. So this is a piece actually by Kung Wu 
based on lanterns he, he fashioned. Uh, these lanterns actually have uh, sensors on them that can track movement, but also they light up. It's connected to each laptop. So they're also independently controllable and addressable uh, visually, and they control the sound. Um, here's an example of conducting. Uh, and what we see here is kind of different approaches to think about you know, what an ensemble is for a particular piece, what instruments go there, will it be scored? Will it be conducted? If so, will it be conducted by a human? If so, how many? And will it also be conducted by a computer in some sense? Uh, and we've done all of that in different combinations. Here's a piece uh, based on Star Trek, actually. So we are the Slork. In fact, this is when the Borg cube comes in and uh, assimilates everyone. But then, you know, here's Captain Kirk. But in the way, he's actually helping us debug the Chuck program. Are you missing a semicolon somewhere? So actually, this is a piece about not only Star Trek, but also kind of what it means to actually work and debug a piece in, uh, in the laptop orchestra. Here's Jack Atherton's VR plus laptop orchestra piece uh, called Resilience. All of these have online videos that we will link to. And this is another kind of uh, just a, a reel of snippets. I'm hoping the sound might treat us a little better for this video. also using the game track controller, but we're kind of controlling these virtual handbells that people are striking. These can actually turn into a bowing interface where people are actually kind of bowing the space around them. and monk chanting in a triple pun uh, title called Monk We See, Monk We Do. And this is a piece called Barrel. conductor here, uh, Mike is actually standing on top of a barrel, uh, just an oil drum, with eight game tracks duct taped to the side. And they're collaboratively controlling this single auto harp-like instrument, while Nick, the soloist to the right, uh, actually has, has a solo later on. This is something we saw actually back in episode three which is Converge. Based on the sounds and, and images from everyday life is captured by mobile phones. Um, this is Game Track Theory. So Nick is here playing an invisible harp. Charlie is plucking the virtual base. So indeed, so these game tracks are detecting kind of where the the locations of the hands and that location is actually sent as each hand is actually sent as a stream of three numbers, X, Y, and Z. And that number is getting interpreted by a Chuck program. Uh, to actually map that to whatever our sonic parameters you want. Uh, for example, you can change the frequency by how you move from left to right. Or in the case of what, what Nick is doing, he is, uh, he basically has set these thresholds which represent where the locations of the strings would be. And so when he brushes hand over it, it plays the sound. Um, and for what Charlie's doing here, 
he's plucking, which can also be detected just from a sudden change in the basically the location. And also there's a bowing interface here where you can basically bow the string and that will also be detected. One more uh, is the, uh, it is the experimental headbang orchestra. <laughs> tethered to the player's heads. And so it's detecting their head bang, but also if they move their head while they're doing this, it actually changes things like it could be like a whammy bar and there's a second tether attached to their hand they can raise. So these are uh, all examples of just pieces people have done of which there have been, I think between Princeton and Stanford, there are, I wouldn't guess over 500, maybe more pieces and almost as many instruments that have been made. And in a way, you know, there's, it also comes in different configurations. We saw kind of more of the full orchestra setting. This is a smaller, more chamber sized ensemble. Um, and this is very much in accordance with, you know, Dan and Perry's original idea that the laptop orchestra is here to make a kind of electronic chamber music. And this again has to do with why these speaker arrays are being used is to kind of provide this sense of sonic intimacy, this kind of presence in the way that the instruments we design can make sound. And that, of course, changes the very music you would write and perform with these instruments. And that would, of course, change how you would design the instruments in the first place. So this intimate chamber setting is really kind of at the heart of the laptop orchestra aesthetic is the one that we've been working with since 2005. And it's in different ways, in different configurations. Here's Rebecca Fiebrink and I in, in a piece we crafted called Plurk Beat Science, um, modeled after uh, uh, the top of beat science. Um, we've done Laptopera. Episode four of Artful Design TV uh, is all about the Laptopera, as well as many collaborations. So here is, Dan, I believe this is Plahara, um, mm -hmm. yep. and with so percussion and Zakir Hussein. And, and in this way, it's, it's really kind of this concerto um, setting. And we have these virtuosos uh, that, that really are kind of these, these lead instruments. And then there's the backing of the laptop orchestra. In this case, I think we had one computer conductor and maybe three human conductors. And you can see Scott Smallwood raising his uh, hand and thumb on, on the left here. That, by the way, is the universal symbol for is everything going okay? <laughs> <laughs> and if someone doesn't raise their hand or like a thumbs down, that's when someone runs over maybe and uh, calmly try to debug the thing on stage. So that's part of the laptop orchestra. So. That's just a bit about what the laptop works here. And so here we, uh, we might get into a bit of the why. So before we uh, ask Dan <laughs> and Perry a bit more about why in the world did you do this, I will read an excerpt from actually a paper that Dan wrote called Why a Laptop Orchestra. In here, and I quote, that the notion of a laptop orchestra is seemingly paradoxical is one of my primary motivations for creating one. The pairing of these two inventions is perhaps obvious only because of its apparent impossibility. One is an almost archaic institution whose continued existence is something of a miracle. The other is a technological newcomer and that has become commonplace and seems likely to be with us at least in some form for quite some time. Yes, the orchestra and the laptop. One serves to perform primarily European music from centuries ago, while the other is a convenient tool for editing text, crunching numbers, browsing the web, and checking email. Never the twain shall meet. So with this, uh, Dan and Perry, what have you, what do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> this is where I leave, right? Is this, this is where I-, I Yes, I no, escape? please don't. Please tell us about why you, you, you have- uh, <laughs> inflicted the laptop orchestra upon the world and really all of us. Um, 
Well, actually, I think you you kind of you really answered that question. I mean, I love this introduction you've you've done, and some of that work I hadn't actually seen, and um, and so for me, the introduction is the answer to the question. It's like all of this really different work and this kind of uh, it, it's it's turned into more than I'd imagined this space where people can experiment and make music of all different types. And uh, to be honest, I'm shocked that people are still doing it. It's fantastic. But like it, it it's just the, the, the amount of creativity, the different kinds of creativity and the different kinds of people involved we just saw in those slides is to me uh, really amazing and, and really gratifying. It's, it's wonderful to, to see that. So, of course, I didn't know that at the time when Perry and I first talked about about doing this. So um, I don't know how much you want me to say right now. Um, actually, that's that's quite perfect because I have a few things lined up to ask okay. both you and Perry and uh, and really has to do again with this kind of origin and uh, getting a bit more into the why. Mm -hmm. uh, first, we I think we could talk about, for example, the sound. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go back into just to show you a couple of things here. <laughs> um, well, before we get there, there is the bassa, mm -hmm. right? Which is something. This is actually part of your 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 dissertation, yeah. uh, your thesis I have it, at Princeton. I have it right here too. It's it's it's. I assembled it uh, this morning. <laughs> wow. So actually, let me go back out of. Uh, are we still in? So can we, I don't know that it, it, I can't make sound with it, but I, I can show it to you if you can, want. Can you do that? Can you tell us yeah, a bit? Yeah. Sure. 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 Uh, you, how much do you want me to tell you? Do you want me to just get it out and show it, or show the parts, or? Let's take a look at what what it is and what we can what you can do with it. Okay. What are all the sensors all right. on it? Yeah, I, I'm going to pull up my seat. Let me know if you can't see what I'm doing. Um, it's quite exciting to uh, get this out. Can you see this? Yes, we can. You can see this? Okay. So, spherical speaker, which interestingly. It, the the each of the hemis it's just two hemis put back back and the hemis are very much like this DeLorean can you see this DeLorean here so uh, we actually broke them into hemis later this was the first time we made one like with this design and then when we started uh, making lots of them the plan was to put them together like this but we decided actually they're really handy as hemis just sitting on the floor so yeah it sits in my lap and um, it has several components. I can, in fact, I'll, I'll, I might even take it apart and show some of it more closely. This is the, the fingerboard, which is a, an ebony fingerboard with sensors on it. There is a, what I call the, the bonge, the bowed sponge, which is a set of uh, sensors that uh, I can bow. And um, I have a sensor bow here. I have a whole box of sensor bows that I built, starting with one actually that this one here, Perry built back in 1996 or so, I think. Um, and this is, I don't know, probably the seventh or eighth bow that I, that I made. And this is probably, I, I last worked on this in probably 2001. So uh, all of this is at least 20, is 20, it's close to 20 years old, uh, this, this instrument. I did turn on the sensors uh, individually. They all seem to work, which is shockingly awesome. Um, but I can bow this, get, I have four different strings here. Uh, I've got a pressure sensor under my finger, a, a sonar sensor that senses how far the, the frog is from, from the bridge here. Um, it all comes apart somewhat unceremoniously. And in fact, sometimes as a performance stunt, I will put it together on stage or take it apart on stage and, and play it in bits. I'm just taking off the fingerboard right now because it's, it's, I can show it more closely if I do that. It just screws in here. And actually, before I unscrew it, one of the funny things was that it's, it's actually mobile like this, which was, of course, not planned, but it ended up being super handy. This, this uh, has a, an accelerometer in it so that it can actually sense the tilt and angle of the, of the, of the fingerboard, and that becomes an interesting expressive uh, parameter for it as well. So I'll just pull these up closer in case people want to see them a little bit better. It's super primitive. I mean, this is a sheet of paper over a bunch of sensors. Here's the, the receivers for the ultrasonic sensors. Uh, I think this is a little storage, wooden storage container that I got at like a craft store and 
I don't know, it was about the right size. There's some Velcro here so that I can stick it on the top uh, very easily. Um, and then this has a position sensor, uh, which is the main thing. There's only one though. Uh, that was all I could do at the time. But I figured, oh, I'm holding it. I can put a pressure sensor on the back. Uh, and uh, there's a couple buttons which are handy for, for changing things mid-performance. An accelerometer in here to sense the orientation of, of this. So basically it gives, I think, 13... My memory is that there's, there's something like 13 different uh, data streams that come in from it that uh, are not orthogonal, but they uh, are, all reflect some aspect of, of physically what I'm doing at any, at any particular time. So that's, that's the, the, the basic rough design of, of the BASA. And in a way, if we were to trace back the origin of the, the laptop orchestra, we get to the BASA because, you, as you said, like this is, at some point, I think you... I think it was at the end of your 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 thesis, right? In in at Princeton was like, hey, uh, what if there were many of these, and what if there's like a group of people playing such such bosses? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and but I think that the wonderful and dangerous thing about asking why is I think we we find there are more whys behind that. For example, if we're to say why did you build the bossa, I feel like the answer actually might be hanging behind you. If I'm not mistaken, you are not mistaken. <laughs> you are indeed not mistaken. Um, yeah, so I'm a fiddler. I've been I've played fiddle since I I was four years old. My earliest memories are of fiddle music and violin music, and uh, uh, I I played it my whole life. And it's one of those things. It's hard to imagine. I I can't. My identity as a person and as a fiddler is sort of confused. I'm not sure if I'm a person who happens to play fiddle or if I'm a fiddler who happens to be a person. But um, uh, I, I've been doing this my whole life and it's, it's, um, it's a really holistic embodied kind of experience. I mean, when I, when I play the fiddle, the, my whole body is involved. Um, the sound comes in through my jaw and in, in, in the body. It's a very social thing uh, where I, I, I grew up making music with my family in our living room. Um, I, I, you know, love nothing more than playing, you know, with one or two other fiddlers. Um, and so, um, th and there's a real, you know, like I said, physical and sonic aspect to it that is dear to me. It's very precious to me and it's really why I'm a musician. Uh, I will add, and I think this is a part, part of the answer to this question, is that uh, the notion of performance is actually quite far down the list of priorities for me in that regard. As a fiddler, as a violinist, I'm, I'm much more motivated by making music with other people or exploring music even myself. Uh, the whole pr process of then going on stage is, is a, a important thing that I love to do, but it's not why I do this. Uh, it's much more about, about exploring musical spaces, trying to find new ways of making music, uh, both myself and and with other people. So um, the uh, the it's any time I approached technology early on and still to this day, the the fiddles here and they're these two beautiful Norwegian fiddles that I have there. Uh, they set a very high bar for for what I'm excited about in terms of making music and working with physical objects that make sound and and require our bodies to do kind of weird contortions. Um, and so they're, they, and I have them hanging here. Normally they hang on the wall, so they're always out and reminding me and mm. tempting me to play them. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this might be actually a, a, a good time to also bring on Perry to see what he has to add to this. And actually, before, as we do that, I also have a picture, I believe, of Dan here, mm -hmm. actually in this particular uh, apparatus that yep. pictured here. Um, and the first of all, Perry, are you, are you there? I see Perry. I am hmm. unmuted now. Okay, ah. cool. Hi, Perry. How are you doing? Welcome back to Harmful Design TV. I'm, I'm here. Okay. Hey, Perry. <laughs> Hi, Dan. <laughs> it's been a long time. I like your shirt. Thank yeah, you. it has. I know. <laughs> so, we, so as, as you've heard, we've come from laptop orchestra back to the BASA. 
we went to Dan's kind of origin and, and a bit of why I think what drives him, I think, uh, you know, as really the, as a person, right? And it's it, it, the fiddle, it's the music, it's the, the physical embodied, like is the instrument an extension of the body or is the body an extension of the instrument? Is that even a question we need to ask, right? And, uh, um, and, then, and then there's this thing, the end body project. So this is stuff that you and Dan all, I think worked on uh, back at Princeton some almost more than 20 years ago now. Mm -hmm. So yep. uh, any, anything you have to say <laughs> about this? Uh, I think all I would add or reiterate or reinforce is that most of the things you've seen were Dan's crazy ideas. So um, just as we discussed with Chuck, uh, came in one day and said, what about this? And I said, okay, go for it. Dan did say in his thesis, what, you know, what if there was an orchestra of extended hyper meta, meta speakery sensory instruments? And that was the genesis of Plork. This in-body project was sort of my attempt to put some science behind But Dan came in one day and said, I hate playing through a guitar amp with my electric fiddle or with an amplified fiddle. Isn't there a way to radiate sound more naturally like an instrument. And so I think within the week I had gone and bought two metal salad bowls and burned my hands and made myself deaf sawing holes in them. Actually, I and think, didn't you build made the, the big first. first? Didn't you build the big, the boulder Maybe first? I, I, built those, I built those roughly at the same time, the boulder and the bomb. The bomb was actually a, a structure very much like uh, what Guh has on the screen, so, except uh, what, Guh has, what Guh has on the screen is for microphones facing in. The boulder was speakers facing out. And so it was about in, 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 in total about this big with individual speaker cabinets uh, facing outward, 12 of them. And, um, then the, the bomb was just these two metal salad bowls that literally looked like one of the first nuclear containment devices. And um, we That's were off and running with some of the speakers. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yes. yes, still exists. <laughs> so, so basically, um, so this is all connected, much like this lattice here. And so the laptop will should use these hemispherical speaker rays, which in a way we saw in the BASA. The boss, the reason I think Dan built that is because he's trying to get this embodied presence sonically of the fiddle, right? In this deconstructed violin reconstructed. In fact, that's, I believe, the name of one of the papers you all wrote about the bossa. Um, and really it's taking all the, the functional uh, physical elements that you interact with in, in like a fiddle or a violin and, and remaking them with sensors but very crucially, you preserve the sonic characteristic of the fiddle in that it is not a thing that makes sound from a PA system from around you, but rather it may emanate sound from the artifact itself, right? And in a way, this structure, right, and this Perry said is actually the opposite of the bassa in a sense that this is not emanating sound, but this is trying to capture kind of the spherical radiation of sound. Um, so for example, in this case, is that a fiddle in the middle? that you're- mandolin. That's a mandolin. It's a mandolin. And yep. you, I'm guessing you're whacking that gently with a hammer or something like that to get it something about its impulse. And then the- It's actually this mandolin. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Just like a and the key is, is that if you're, it, every time you pluck a string, this vibrations on the string couple to the body at one point and the body radiates the sound into space. So if you can capture that, the, the transfer function from that coupling point into the room, you've captured what the body does. And so that sound without the ringing, if you mute the strings and do this, that radiates and engages the room. And essentially every vibration of the string just launches one of those. And so if you can capture that, uh, which is what Dan's doing, He's actually hitting that mandolin right on the bridge with $900 hammer, which, uh, which we bought, which measures the force when you smack the bridge and we record that. So we recorded the hammer 
and all 12 channels on the multi-track digital. And um, those are actually available if anyone wants to use those. If you want to put a mandolin body or Dan's Hardinger fiddle body or Dan's wife Monica's guitar body onto a model or sing through it or uh, put your favorite uh, string model attached to that, those are available. Uh, you can all download those and you can use a convolution, convolution reverb to, um, to attach that transfer function of the body. And the body radiates differently in different directions. So um, in front, right above the F hole is sort of the sweet spot where you would put a microphone. Behind the player, it's quite muted and soft as you would expect. And so we did a series of these without player and also with player. So later on, I stood in this thing and whacked the mandolin. And Dan stood in this thing and whacked on his, uh, his uh, Hardinger fiddle. So that's what this thing is. Yeah, it's really cool. Cause I remember, I mean, the, the boulder and the bomber are, are, and also the boss is really like, basically if you can capture these multi-point microphone uh, for, of what this thing sounds like and you can model it, then if you turn these microphones into speakers that radiate outward, you've captured something about this kind of the approximation of this point source, this, this spherical emanation of sound that then gives you, what that translates to is a kind of a physical presence that, oh, there is something that's making sound physically in space right there, right? So in a way, this is like, if you were to keep digging into why a laptop works and how this thing came about, this would be like one of the key motivations. Um, I wanna bring up another artifact here. And uh, in this one is, can everyone see this? I'm actually gonna zoom in here to one part. This is actually Dan and Perry's proposal to the, uh, the Science and Technology Council for new upgraded courses for non-science and interdisciplinary students. This was the proposal for Princeton Laptop Orchestra. We have to Florch. know that at that time, it's Plorch, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's Plorch. So, which makes sense, right? It's the, the orch, the orchestra. And, and uh, in, at some point, Plorch became Plork. How did, why did that happen? How did that happen? Did I, I don't remember exactly how that happened, but I think I was just so repulsed by saying Plorch over and over again that... <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad that happened. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, if you kept Plorch, like, there would be no Slork. We'd be <laughs> Slorch. And there's all kinds of other, like, just butterfly fly effects that could have emanated from this. And by the way, I think there's, as of when someone did like a survey like eight years ago, there's something like 75 uh, laptop orchestras, likely much more now. And so in a way, you, you two started something that really caught on. It sounds like beyond your original necessarily intention. <laughs> Definitely. But it's certainly, I mean, it's something that I think for, for, for us, at Stanford in the Stanford laptop orchestra. I mean, we, when I came to Stanford, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to bring the idea of the laptop orchestra over. And, you know, that a lot of things, there's a lot of things that didn't need to change. What changed was the music that we make with this medium. So I think it was just like a letter change, plork to slork. We kept the same aesthetic. We even kept the idea you sit on mats and pillows. Um, and in fact, in, uh, next week, uh, Slork's co-director, Matt Wright, who's actually been so helpful every week in giving wonderful tips and links and explanations over chat, he will be our guest next week. So I think that the lineage, in a way, it continues. And there's Matt uh, saying hello. I don't, Matt, we will have you, we'll see you in full uh, next, next week, but please continue to comment over chat. Um, and... And the next thing I think we want to talk about, by the way, if anyone has questions or other thoughts, please post them into chat and we will we'll take time to, uh, to discuss that together as a group. And really the last part of the laptop work, so I think is something about its role, not only as an ensemble, as an instrument design lab, but as a kind of classroom for, it's, it's really a vision for teaching music for teaching technology for teaching performance for teaching design in a like 
super confused in a good way, kind of a way, I should say not confused, but fused way, right? Like these things are not separate things. So what I have here, if the audio holds, uh, I have here, and I'm gonna actually now share my screen again. Um, this is the first, very first time the laptop orchestra had made music together. And this is the very first class of a laptop orchestra. This is back in fall of 2005 at Princeton in, in, a, in a freshman seminar that is the Princeton Laptop Orchestra. Let's see if the audio comes through. Uh, here we go. Harmony. Three. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, R, J, K, L, M, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, O, S, Y, Z. Before we finish this video, so uh, Dan, you want to tell us what we're witnessing here? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I I do remember that it was hard in kind of an interesting way, and 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 they had all recorded their own voices, mm -hmm. saying the alphabet, I believe, and and had attached it to particular keys, and then there were I think comb filters that you it, you it sent them home with code. You yeah. sent them home with an assignment in code to hit the key and say the word like five That's right. times. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this one's an easy mapping problem. You yeah. can just, you can just, if if you wanted to be. But and then the sound was processed in in uh, uh, through comb filters is what it sounds yeah. like, right? And yeah. and yeah. you arranged it into a three part harmony. Yeah. Um, and and I I remember the thought here was that this was going to be the very first like performance of the lap. So it seems like the ABC song, learning to say the ABC seemed really fitting. So I'm going to try to finish this video because uh, I think the next part is like when part of the song goes, when I know my ABCs, we didn't have complete words. So I think you just had them say the first letter of, you know. Oh, that could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that, so you hear individual letters for that. So let me, let's go back and finish this. That was, uh, you know, it, it was really the first time and everyone, we had no one, I think up to that point knew exactly what a laptop orchestra could sound like because that was literally the first moment that the laptop orchestra actually made music together. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before I move on to uh, other parts, aspects of the classroom, uh, Dan or Carrie, <laughs> anything else to, to add? Um, I, I, I will add that it was absolutely terrifying. I, I remember standing in front of this class and um, you know, they're students and they think that I know what I'm doing and I had absolutely no idea. And, um, I, you know, I'm really grateful actually to several years of students who were really game to just go along and, and invent this thing together with us. And uh, so it, it actually makes me really happy to see that I'd totally forgotten about it. Harry, any, any words? Oh, there's just so much. I mean, the the cool part about that is it didn't require any networking, so that couldn't go wrong. But everything else could go wrong because it's the least robust form of conducting possible. If anyone hits a key too early or hits two keys, they're off in the score by one note. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, you know, the worst step sequencer right. in the hands of, of a, a dozen and a half fresh people. Right. And so we should add, this was a freshman seminar. So right. they had no idea that this couldn't be done, which I think really yeah. encouraged us to just do whatever, <laughs> you know, they, they weren't there saying, you know, this, this is never going to work. That was us, <laughs> but, but we did it anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I remember this quite vividly because uh, Scott Smallwood and I were your TAs in this, in, in this first yes. instantiation. And I remember the four of us being much more like really scared, but the, our students had no idea how frightened we were of things not working. So they were completely fearless and they were just like, they were like, they were the energy that really drove this and, and, and showed us what, what was possible. Yeah. Speaking of that, I want to show, uh, highlight of just a few of our students here. Um, this, you can see what a colorful cast of characters we have. This is a video of Theo. This is not captured intentionally. This is me trying to capture uh, the setup before class, right? Yeah, you've got a Hey Gary. Here comes Theo who notices the camera on the tripod. Yeah, you know, what are you doing? Theo. Okay. So that's Theo. He was awesome. And uh, but you know, like everyone else, he, he was he had a personality and in hilariously, this is like the only surviving footage I have of setting up. <laughs> of that year for the laptop orchestra. And it's because I made this like 10 second video of Theo flipping us off. So there you go. Um, I do want to say like, for me, I feel like um, that the laptop orchestra was started by people who are not, I don't know, completely in their right mind and <laughs> attracted people who are also not entirely in the right mind, <laughs> including myself, was actually a reason why I think it worked so well and and really became a thing that is that is freeing right there's no like specific type of music you're to make with a laptop orchestra this is one of the ethos i remember that dan and perry really you really clearly um articulate it is that we're not here to make a particular kind of music we're here to explore what we can do with this medium and as long as we take advantage of the medium we should make what music we have we want to make um, and also just to give you my personal impression of kind of like kind of this whole endeavor this is uh, a video of Perry let's go to all the fries because they have themes one's a pyramid and that's on our trip on a plural trip to Washington DC to perform in a museum I believe this is back in 2007 and I think I flew back I was my first year at Stanford I flew back and we drove down from Princeton to, to DC. And this is us start stopping in a rest area to get, I guess, ice cream and a, and a burger. And Perry's telling me about this wonderful store in California called Fry's. Oh, yeah, it's Fry's. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean. Let's yeah. go to all the Fry's because they have fries. themes. One's a pyramid. One isn't like an Egyptian pyramid. One in Palo Alto is a Western thing. Wow, I think that one's right down the street from where I live. Right, actually, sadly, the Western theme fries right down the street from here is actually closing. Um, Just sadly, closed. But I, yep. Yep. And I, I, but the, all the other fries, the other fries, I think, are there. In fact, there's even a fries whose whose theme is sine waves. And for those who don't know, fries is this giant, amazing, and probably one of the most poorly organized electronic store I've ever been to. But it's kind of it works. I love it. It's huge. You can find a lot of stuff there. And I have no idea how they stay in business um, just because of a number of factors, but I kind of love them. And then there is, uh, there's Perry. And I mean, there's Dan, who I think somehow this Cornholio personality came out. And I believe Perry may have started this on a trip. Again, this is not for the laptop orchestra to Montreal to perform at a network concert. At some point, I think everyone was really tired and Perry was taking a nap in the somewhere in this van we had rented and suddenly we look in the back in the river mirror and Perry pops up and goes, I am Cornholio. Uh, and, and that kind of just caught on. Um, <laughs> that's Dan on the return trip of the same trip to DC at a gas station, just heading back to Princeton in which he has, has, become cornholio. So I'm showing you the because this is kind of my headspace of like, yeah, these are 
the kind of people that are starting this. And in a way that is, again, as I mentioned, I think back in the episode two with Perry's that when these are the leaders, you feel a, just an immense and genuine sense of freedom to go be yourself. And so I have to say that as a, as a grad student back at Princeton, I, I am internally grateful for the, for the, for the, <laughs> for the latitude that I think not only what we did, but how, kind of how we did it. And I think, you know, this is, I think everyone who has worked with, with either Dan or Perry, I think can say the same. And so, there you go. Um, and so by the way, here's some more historical photos of like the, the laptop orchestra. Uh, this is actually us like soldering together, the, you know, kind of fusing together these two power, the amps that goes in the rack of the very first version, right? And, and there's Scott Smallwood at the top right. Uh, there's me apparently with the perm. That's kind of scary. Um, and here's kind of, you know, we taught this class, uh, you know, in exactly the way that Dan and Perry, I think, had envisioned it, which was there's no separation between, well, a studio class, a music class, a programming class, and a live performance course. What if you did this all kind of at the same time, right? And as one entity. And what struck me about all of this um, is that I think is the refusal to let, to, to kind of categorize students into specialties. What I mean by this is that you have students coming in to plork and to slork from computer science, from music, from biology, from economics, from the business school. And, but there's no, there's never, in fact, there's this intentional uh, getting away from this idea that, hey, you come from a computer science background, you can be the programmer on the team. Or, hey, you come from a music background, you can be the more musical, the composer on the team knows. Everyone had to do some of everything. In a way, it was maybe not the most efficient thing, but from a pedagogical point of view, I think it's made everyone f understood the entire flow. And actually, I have to say, at least for me, artistically, that refusal to put people into buckets actually made better art. And that's just my, my take on this because everyone, I think, owned all of it or some part of all of it. So it, that, uh, there's a lot more we could say about the teaching. In fact, we have a paper on, there's so much material actually in, pre in preparing this episode, I got lost in the sea of archives, of videos, of images, of papers, of proposals, uh, of concerts, of recordings. Um, and I have just a few more things, but uh, you know, any, Dan Perry, you know, kind of looking back at, at Plork <laughs> and everything that Plork has spawned and spurred in, in really the 15 years since its inception, how do you feel about the Laptop Orchestra today? Do you regret uh, it? <laughs> well, I, I love it. I, I should say that I, I actually am, am a spectator now at Princeton. I mean, Jeff Snyder mm -hmm. is a brilliant instrument builder, musician, improviser who, who directs the laptop orchestra here and has for, for many years and, and has taken it to all these incredible places that, that actually beyond what I, what I could have done. And so I, I have really been witnessing and not participating for the last few years. Um, and I'm still struck by how, um, I, I think a related thing to what you're saying about not putting categories and, and, and trying to put people in different buckets and so on. It's just the sense of inclusivity, the sense that anybody can join this and try to make it what they what they want. Uh, there's also a, a real uh, flattening of, of levels. So, uh, you know, that first semester we had freshmen, but immediately after that, we had uh, an intense semester where we had uh, undergraduates of all levels. We had several graduate students. We had faculty. Um, and we had all these guest artists, people like Zakir, who you, who you saw, but also Paul Lansky and Brad Garten and Tommy A. Hahn and Pauline Oliveros and so on, all coming in and, and working with us. And we were, it was interesting is that we were all in it together and nobody really knew anything more than anybody else about what we could do, which was really exciting. And, and that still, it, you know, of course, you know, there's been progress of a sort and we you know there's there's benefit to experience but i still feel like there's a sense of that that ability to to come in and 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 decide what you want to make there and what what it, what you want it to be 
Thank you, Dan. I, I could not agree more with, with personally with that, that ethos. Perry, anything else you want, you want to say? <laughs> Perry is speechless. I, uh, I, I am still speechless at the archival videos, which you've been showing, but with many of which I have, but um, yeah, there's sort of, I mean, at some point, I think we really soon now an interesting point is you you showed the end body project where we're capturing very carefully the impulse response of this mandolin or something. None of those body impulse responses were ever used for any plurk piece as far as I know. Mm -hmm. We never tried to radiate the way a violin does. Dan and I went to one conference and he played his electric fiddle through some body impulse responses just to show that you could put a cello on an electric fiddle or something like that, but it was really sort of demo science. It wasn't, you know, part of the art making, certainly of the laptop orchestras. Once we had made these speakers in these workstations, um, making new music was really what it was about. And so, you know, people specialize using those speakers. Um, a lot of the pieces are mono. And so basically we just use the speaker to couple with the room better than a guitar amp which was Dan's original <laughs> beef when he came in, as he said, guitar ants suck. They only sound, you know, they sound like shit anyway, and they sound good like shit in front of them. And nobody <laughs> else can hear it. Nobody in a chamber ensemble, nobody else. And so, and they're no good monitors if you're behind it. And so um, these solve that. Having the players sit on the floor and be close to that speaker, making them responsible for their acre of sonic real estate and their part of the score and their part of the performance um, was I think really critical to making it an ensemble, to making it not a computer science class and making it not just a weird electronic music class and not a studio class, but it really was an orchestra. Um, and so uh, in terms of the laptop orchestra classroom, I think the miracle and the brilliance that, that Dan brought, uh, aside from the idea and all the other stuff, was we managed to wrangle this into a credit, a series of credit courses at Princeton. When the orchestra itself was not a credit course, Plork was. And so we had a handle on the students. They had to show up and they had to do stuff and they had to do their homework and they had to be on time. <laughs> And so, um, so we took a lot of lessons from the orchestra. We made them show up ready to play, um, not, you know, ideally. We, we knew we would spend an hour and a half debugging everybody's software if they, you know, waited till they got to class to install it. And so um, a lot of that stuff was, was really critical to making it more like a real ensemble. Um, and then making it a real class made it, as I said, integral to their educational experience and their GPA, which was, you know, is the key in many schools. <laughs> and so, oh. and I think the hook between music and CS is what allowed us to make that into a credit course is, is the key. Well, thanks for setting that precedence because certainly at, uh, at Stanford, it's, it, it was e much easier to argue for it once it's been shown that it can be done and, and there, there are benefits to this. And, to wrap up today, before we actually open up for questions, time check, it is uh, three minutes after the hour. For those of you that need to go on to, uh, to the next parts of your day, please feel free to, to do so. Thank you so much for joining us, but we're gonna stick around for just a bit more. I've, I'm gonna wrap up here with just one more student profile and we're gonna open up for questions. And, uh, and this profile is actually of uh, a student pictured here and let me give you put into full screen here. Actually, you can see this is the, this is the freshman seminar, and on the right we see Anna Whitstruck. Anna actually has gone on. This is actually one of the first classes she's ever taken as an undergraduate. This is her first semester at Princeton, so she somehow entered into the very first plurk. Um, she had went on to do a. Uh, actually a musicology PhD at Stanford. And now she's an assistant professor and the director of orchestra uh, at the University of Puget Sound in the School of Music. So 
our plurkers have gone on to do a lot of wondrous and musical and other things, but and, and in a way, we, I, we will always remember our, our, uh, our first plurkers and really all of our plurkers. I do want to put one thing that, that Anna wrote, and I know it can be hard to read, so I'm going to just read this. This is actually something Anna uh, wrote as a feedback, kind of a reflection on the course. It was actually to one of the assignments. However, Anna wrote, when everything worked the way it was supposed to, when my spontaneous arrangement of computer lingo transformed into a musical composition, it was a truly amazing experience. The ability to control duration and pitch with loops, integer, and frequency notation sent me on a serious power trip. It was so exciting to figure out how to control the exact rhythm produced by the shred, it's a Chuck process, and I started working out rhythmic patterns on scrap paper in the form of musical nota music notation and then transferring it mathematically to the shred composition itself. Last paragraph. I really like the on-the-fly command system as well. It may have driven my roommate crazy, but I was definitely jamming the whole way through. The only real problem with this assignment was knowing when to stop and get on with the rest of my work. This is so much better than memorizing French verbs. Anna Wittstruck, 2005. So, I, in a way, I think that speaks to both what Dan and Perry have been saying about the laptop orchestra as a learning environment, and not the least of which for the people that are actually trying to teach it. So this is one of those things that is, you know, I guess I started today's episode saying it's all an experiment. This would be a shining example of an experiment. And uh, sometimes large, faster the train and larger the flaming mass around it, uh, the more interesting. So with this, I think we want to open up for any questions. I believe there are, there are some. And um, let's see, Kangwu, any, uh, any questions you want to forward or foreground? Yeah, Bonnie asks, what are some of your new projects? Aha, I have a slide for that. Um, so uh, as for Dan. Dan, do you want to talk uh, about you? Sure, sure, no, great. Um, uh, yeah, I, and that's one of my main projects right now is a, is a direct consequence of, of the years of of work in the laptop orchestra. Uh, I've been working for a number of years on a project called uh, the Bit Clavier, which is a kind of uh, digital piano that has embedded in it a series of sort of specifically designed kind of algorithms, uh, little virtual metronomes that come back at you uh, uh, in different ways, depending on how you, how you set it up. Uh, different uh, kinds of reverse uh, notes based on what you play. And also uh, it engages pretty deeply in, in the history of tuning so that the instrument can be tuned up in various ways on the fly as you play it, it can change its, its tuning. And um, I've written a lot of my music in the last few years has been with, with the bit clavier with by itself, uh, with other ensembles. Um, and it's a direct outgrowth of what I did in the laptop orchestra, which really for me became a crucible for instrument design, for trying to make things for other people to make music with. Uh, and that was a real sea change for me because before that, I'd always been making things for me to make music with, which is fun, I really like that. Uh, but it's a, it is a different question if you try to make something for somebody else to make music with. Um, and I did that and started writing music for other ensembles uh, with instruments that I had built. Um, and so uh, BitClavier has been a several years in the works and it's uh, quite exciting for me. I see you've got this uh, video of Christina Altamira up. Uh, she's going to, if, if you want to play that, that's a, or I don't know, if, did you want to play that or what did you want to do? I'm going to try to play, hopefully the audio holds. All of this oh, yeah, will yeah. be, we'll fix this in post for the recording, but also we'll link to this in the Artful Design TV archive. But let me try to play this. Thank you. 
this is kind of a, a, like a piano with a programmable mind in a sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's a, you know, just a quick summary is she basically plays the same a pattern over and over again and the instrument changes around her. So at the beginning, all you're hearing are the sounds of the keys and the hammers being released so that the attacks don't do anything. But when the keys are released, you get the sound of the hammers and, and it's set up to be really loud, like much louder than you would normally hear it. And then over the course of the piece, uh, other aspects of the instrument start to return. And for a short moment, we actually hear the piano as you would expect to hear it. Um, but uh, for the most part, it's just changing as she plays, which is both sort of thrilling and terrifying for the pianist. And someone put the link here, bitclavier.com. Um, and also this is an app that you can download Right, and you can yeah. basically do this, incorporate this into your performance practice or explore it for whatever expressive uh, purposes you have. Um, yeah, uh, and I think that's just one of the many things I think you're working on, Dan. Let's see, let's take a, another question um, from Vizda. How do you find the balance between designing an instrument and mastering it? Where do you stop tweaking the technology to improve the mastery? The golden question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, I don't have an answer uh, in part because there are so many ways that that process could go. Where, whether, so for instance, if you're designing a new physical interface, that raises a whole host of challenges in terms of teaching your body how to, to be with that instrument. Um, and uh, that can be really hard. Or in some cases, for instance, the tethers, the game track controllers, which you've shown, for some reason have a magical ability to be both sort of flexible and constantly engaging, um, but, you know, easy to, to learn, at least initially. Um, so that one seems to, as an interface, uh, provided people with a number of ways to build software where players can spend more or less time learning how to play the instrument. Um, um, but it's a really hard question because you, you need to, there's this constant feedback loop of making something, playing it, seeing if it's musically inter interesting and trying to get basically lost in the flow, you know, get, get in the zone making music with it. And then you find uh, it's actually not working. So you have to go back to instrument design, coding, soldering mode, whatever it might be. Um, it's, it's quite, quite a challenge. And I think at some point, I think a couple of weeks ago, people said, well, you know, you, you, you take it on the stage and, and you perform. And I think there's truth to that. Like at some point you just, you just sit down and you make music with it. Um, I will say for myself right now, the, the bit clavier, one of the interesting things about that is that it leverages existing technique and interfaces. And so it's been quite interesting for me and the pianist I've been working with to see how their expert piano technique can both help them get into the instrument and do things they have not done before, but it also, the instrument really challenges them. So for instance, this piece you just saw, it focuses on the key releases and pianists are not used to focusing on the exact releases in a rhythmic way, in the same way that say maybe organists are or something like that. So um, th it's a different question here because it's a known interface with a lot of technology, a lot of skills built into players' hands already. That is always the question. And, and, and we actually also have some uh, um, more, I don't know if there are wis words of wisdom or more mercenary answers, maybe both. Uh, Matt suggested before or after the beginning of the performance, ha ha ha, in which, to which Kung Wu followed or during. And Henry notes, quote, you never finish, you just stop. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of wisdom in all of this. Uh, so. Yeah, if there are no more questions, I think it, I want to take this chance to, to thank, thank you, Dan, so much for joining us in Artful Design TV. Thanks to Perry, who've had to go to, I believe, a vet appointment. Um, but thank you both so much for joining us. But also, thanks, Dan, for, for doing what you do and being just such a wonderful person while you're doing it. Thank and you, guys. Silent you. clap from all of us on Zoom to, for Dan. And right back at you, Gu, you know, you're a constant inspiration. So thank you so much for having me. 
You know, it's a, just in the video we see setting up, that's you every week. You're in the front line, actually, like in, in, the, in the trenches with everyone, like all the time. And that's something I, I will never forget. So uh, with this, let us uh, do our dance and <laughs> we will end for today. Thank you all very much for joining us. And let me see one more time. You know what to do. My lucky, my lucky, my lucky, my lucky, my lucky, my lucky, my lucky. Right. Thank you all so much for joining Artful Design TV. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay artful. We'll see you next week. Signing off.